shall not rest upon the lot of the righteous, lest the righteous put forth their hands unto iniquity. Do good, O Lord, unto those that be good, and to them that are upright in their heart. As for such as turn aside unto their crooked ways, the Lord shall lead them forth with the workers of iniquity. But peace shall be upon Israel. And then we go to Psalm 128, also a song of degrees. Blessed is every one that feareth the Lord, that walketh in his ways. For thou shalt eat the labor of thine hands. Happy shalt thou be, and it shall be well with thee. Thy wife shall be as a fruitful vine by the sides of thine house. Thy children like olive plants round about thy table. Behold that thus shall the man be blessed that feareth the Lord. The Lord shall bless thee out of Zion. And thou shalt see the good of Jerusalem all the days of thy life. Yea, thou shalt see thy children's children and peace upon Israel. Amen. May the Lord bless the reading of his word and the preaching um, further. And let us now, um, if you wish to, to follow um, as I read the form of baptism, it can be found. We turn now our attention back to Psalm 128. And we, we hope to consider, um, especially this psalm, but even as this psalm is, is embraced by, by the full array of what are called the, the songs of degrees or psalms of um, ascent from Psalm 120 all the way to Psalm 134. You, you may be familiar with this. Some your, your Bibles may have the, the initial phrasing, a song of degrees. It starts in 120 and it goes all the way to 134. Um, so in a sense, every psalm here is to be understood in, in the whole context of these many psalms. The psalms of ascent or of degrees were so called because no matter where you came, from, from Judah or from upper Israel. Um, to go to Jerusalem meant to go up because Jerusalem stood higher up in terms of the terrain. And so as they left their little villages and their little towns in the countrysides of Judea and Israel, they, they did their pilgrimage toward Jerusalem and it was an ascent. It was, it was degrees in which they were going higher and higher all the way to, to Mount Zion, to the temple. Um, every single Jewish man was commanded to go, and if possible, to take his whole family three times a year, three times a year, and, and do this pilgrimage during the Feast of Passover and Tabernacles and Pentecost. And as they went, they sang. And as they left their little, um, little towns and little villages, um, the, the initial songs, they would have started on Psalm 120. And if you follow the themes, they, they begin with, with local elements, with things that were very personal. If, if you look at Psalm 120, it, it is, In my distress I cried. And, and 120 takes a certain area, and imagine if you were someone who lived in Meshek and in Kedar, how personal Psalm 120 would be to you. See, it's, it's people leaving these areas, and even if you weren't in that city, but you were somewhere else, when you began singing this psalm, you, you knew that although that's not your town, it's the same context. Here I am, leaving my town, and there were always these elements of danger, and, and so Psalm 120 is just thinking of the, the local reality of the blessing that God has protected your little town, your little village, even though there have been elements of, of 
difficulties in, in your very area. And, and as you progress, think of this reality that as people left their little towns and joined the main highway, they would meet with other groups that had met their own towns. And as they kept singing in progression, the themes went from local concerns and cares to more global concerns and cares to the point where if you go to Psalm 120, the, the great blessing they're asking is not just that God helped me here in, in um, Meshach and in Kedar, but all of Israel and they're remembering the blessings of when God delivered them from the great exile in, in Egypt. And so the themes go from local that would relate to the experience of their little towns and their countryside realities to the whole reality of, of Israel and the need of all the peoples. And, and if, if you go to the very center of this, this array of Psalms, it is Psalm 127 and 128. That's number 8 and number 9. And they're the Psalms that focus on the family, that focus on family life. And we will, we will be considering this reality um, in, our, in our first point. But just one more word before we, we go into our two points. Blessing is what they were singing about throughout. The blessings of God's deliverance for their own little hamlet. The blessings for God's deliverance for all the people. And as we read in Psalm 128, it starts, Blessed is everyone that fears the Lord. And then it goes to the very center of everything. Thy wife shall be a fruitful vine by the sides of thine house. Thy children like olive plants round about thy table. I just want to start with this, beloved. I know that you will agree. I don't need to prove this point. Every single human in the entire face of the world desires exactly this blessing. In our first point, we will start by defining blessing. And this will become very, very established that, that it is very true. Our, our first point will be the blessed life. And then our second point will be the secret, the, the secret to the blessed life. This is why our theme is the secret to the blessed life. This psalm reveals the secret. We find it's, it's not really a secret in that it is hidden for anyone who has eyes to see. It is very clear and very evident. And yet you, you need to do some, some understanding so that you're not committing a very great mistake in pursuing that secret to the blessed life. So first, let's start with understanding this blessing. What is this blessing? In our first point, we'll, we'll see a definition of this blessing. Even, even though blessing is a word we use very often, and, and most of us know what it means, but a lot of people in this world do not really understand the full array of this word. And then secondly, we'll see in this, in this psalm, still in this first point, the realm of blessing. In what area of life are we speaking of blessing? I mentioned family, but is that all? And we will see that it isn't. It's more than that. So, first of all, what is blessing? A simple definition. Well, it helps when, when God's Word itself, um, the translators of, of the ancient texts, they found different words to translate the word blessing. It's not the word blessing everywhere. Um, even here in the King James, if you look at Psalm 127, verse 5, the very verse before we get to Psalm 128, it says, Happy is the man that has his quiver full of them, speaking of children and the great blessing of having children. And there, they don't use the word blessed, they use the word happy. But it is the very same word in Hebrew. And even in our Psalm 128, verse 2, it says, For thou shalt eat the labor of thine hands, happy shalt thou be. And it's, it's very, a great blessing that the translators of the King James chose to vary a little bit in what words to use to help us realize the array of the word blessing in Hebrew. It doesn't just mean um, blessing. It means happiness, and then that helps us understand blessing. And it's not just happiness. You could also use the word fulfillment. 
You could say, fulfilled is everyone that feareth the Lord. And fulfilled in what way? In a sense of satisfaction. That's another word. Or you could say, abiding joy. Like a deep, true joy that no matter what will never, ever go away. You could use the word peace, contentment. It is really all of these words put together. That's what blessing means. And so you agree, don't you, that this is what the whole world is pursuing. Everyone desires. This, this is the key virtue or blessing, blessing itself, that everyone is in pursuit. It is the key desire. It is the key virtue. It is what everyone seeks after. It is what everyone yearns for. And, and one reason we know this is true is because everyone abhors and hates and would do everything, they would pay great money to stay away from the opposites of these very things. When you think of the opposites of, of, of joy, it would be sadness. The opposite of happiness would be sorrow. And so see, blessing is in essence the cure for sadness and sorrow. Blessing is the antidote for depression and despair. It is the balm for unfulfillment and for frustration. Now, if I were to look at the Bible and see the antonym of blessing um, that, is, that is the most technically, theologically speaking, absolute, it's not sorrow, sadness, despair, depression. There's another word. It's the word curse. And what's, what's profound of the word curse, doesn't the very thought of the word curse already bring a certain deep kind of feeling in your heart? And it is this, because curse, technically speaking in the Bible, is what makes all those other words, sorrow, despair, depression, stay. A person who is cursed, or a people who are cursed in the Bible, theologically speaking, it means they're in trouble. They're in danger. You don't want to stay in a place of curse. See, curse means continuously in despair. It means forever in depression. It means unless something happens, and this, this is the great blessing, God's word provides the antidote even for curse. And it's blessing. See, this is why I mean that the word blessing is so powerful and so great. Because everyone hates curse. And, and everyone wants blessing. And so, and so having then blessing, the context of what it means, satisfaction, fulfillment, joy, abiding, peace. Well, let's speak now of the realm, the realm of blessing that this psalm is speaking of. Is it saying that you'll just be happy in your family? Family, we see it's central here, but no. Look how he starts. It starts with, with the work life. For thou shalt eat the labor of thine hands. Happy shalt thou be, and it shall be well with thee. Now, it's not meaning that work is more important than family. But you'll understand why he starts with work. There's a sweet, beautiful knowledge here. Because as soon as you have work being blessed in verse 2, in verse 3, we have the wife at home, fruitful, but there are children like olive plants round about thy table. You would not be able to feed your children if you didn't have labor being blessed. And so, so he, he starts in this beautiful, natural way. You will be blessed in your work life. You will be blessed in your family life. But it doesn't stop there either. In this little psalm, there's something of the progression of all these psalms put together. Remember, we said that in, in all these psalms, it starts with their local realities. Here we are in this little town. There are enemies over there. Lord, we're so thankful that you blessed us from that enemy. And then you think of all of Israel, and they remember when they were in Egypt, and they all together join their voices. Lord, we are so thankful that we were delivered from Egypt. And there's a progression in all these psalms. There's a progression in this little psalm, 128. The progression starts in work. You're blessed, for thou shalt eat the labor of thine hands. Verse 3, Thy wife shall be as a fruitful vine by thy side of thine house. Thy children like olive plants round about thy table. And you will be blessed with the thought. We, we don't have to think of, of how many children we'll have. In those days, they never ever even thought. It didn't cross their minds to do what the world does today. Of limiting for less children. 
because some families had 10 and five died. And so however many babies came into the family, they were so thankful. But they needed to have money and food to feed those babies. And so see, the blessing flows. There will be blessing in work because you will have babies and you'll have to feed them. And then you'll be blessed because your wife will be there, fruitful. She will have a heart for the Lord. And there will be these little babies all around the table. And they will be blessed because there will be food for them. But look at the progression. Behold, verse 4, that thus shall the man be blessed that feareth the Lord. Verse 5, the Lord shall bless thee out of Zion. Zion, remember, was not just Jerusalem. Jerusalem. Jerusalem sometimes was called all of Zion. But Zion was the mountain where the temple was. So Zion, per se, is mainly the temple place. And it becomes a key word, as it were, like a, a synonym for the whole church. They will be a blessing to the church. But then that also means, because see, the church will be sending their blessings upon them. So they're the ones who will be blessed. But if they're being blessed, of course the whole church is. Isn't this true, beloved? Um, um, there are two babies, and there are a few families that are more close connected to the blessing. But it's the whole congregation that is blessed in this blessing. There's a blessing out of Zion to them, and there's a blessing from them to Zion. The church in verse 5. But then look, and thou shalt see the good of Jerusalem all the days of thy life. From the church locale, it goes to all of Jerusalem, which is the entire capital city. It goes from the church to the city. And, and there's, there's this growth. And, and so you could think in terms spiritual, that it goes from this little local church to, to the whole entirety of Christ's church throughout the whole world, because it's not just this one. But you can think even in terms of the world. The world is being blessed. The cities of this world are blessed in Charles and Marcus being raised in a family that will teach them about Jesus. And there will be two other little citizens in, in New Jersey and in America who will be lights in this world along with all the other children and all the fathers and mothers who love the Lord. God wants us to understand that this blessing is not just local to a family, not local to a church, but it's to all of Jerusalem. It's really the whole church of the Lord Jesus Christ. And notice and the progression, Yea, thou shalt see thy children's children. See, right there you see progression. It doesn't end with, 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 with the, the Tannis seniors just being blessed with the Tannis juniors, and then, and then they see now their grandson and now a great-grandson being blessed. And I could say the same for the Van Rudenbergs. Their children's children. And look what it says. And peace upon Israel. Israel is the entire country. So there's this progression from Zion to Jerusalem to Israel. That is the church and then the whole city and then the entire country. And, 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 and you're, of course, at this point understanding it doesn't stop here. It, it, it goes to the, the whole world. And so this blessing that I spoke of, that God is promising that there will be this fulfillment, this sense of satisfaction, this sense of joy that is abiding, blessing is for your family, for the whole church, for the entire neighborhood, for all of America, for the entire world. And I think of just one example, William Carey, when he left his little hamlet of England, he was an unknown shoemaker. But God used him in India for the translation of dozens of languages to have the Bible. It took him 18 years for the first convert. But he was a great blessing to India. And he's a great blessing to us because we know what he did there. And we are blessed by God's work and in, in what he does. So, so this blessing will carry on on and on. So here's a definition and here's the realm of blessing. But now let us go to our second point. And of course I had to start with this one to, to whet your appetite in a sense so that you would be desiring this blessing. How can I have this blessing? If, if this is what blessing is, I need it. How can I have it? How can I obtain it? What is the secret to the blessed life. 
Because I need this fulfillment, I need this satisfaction, and I need it for my work, I need it for my family, and, and I want it for my neighborhood, I, I want it for my whole church. How can I have it? And, and, and as I said, God's word is, is not obscuring anything, it is very clear. It is our heart that obscures things. And so we need to be very careful in this pursuit because many have failed. And there are many people today who say, I tried the church. They promised many things, but I never received them. So I left. But you talk to them a while and you realize they, they never had eyes to see what actually God's word makes very clear. But our human hearts get it in the way. Remember, I said that the whole entire world is wanting this very blessing. They're wanting this fulfillment, this sense of peace. Who, who in their right mind don't prefer that over curse? Why is it that they don't find it? Well, let us look at God's word to, to seek for the secret of this blessing. Well, well verse 1 starts, Blessed is everyone that feareth the Lord. So the first thing that brings to our mind, that must come to our mind, is fear of the Lord. Now, that's where we start. It's where the psalm starts. It is fearing the Lord. There will be no such blessing if you do not fear the Lord. And when we speak of fearing the Lord, it, it, we are speaking not, not of, a, of, a, of a phobia, not of a, not of a dread in and of itself, but the word fear is not a key word that means something else. There are the elements of dread and of horror even in the word fear, but, but you, you've heard it explained. We're going to have it explained again because fear of God is also where we kind of get confused. It is reverence to God. It is honor to God. And where is the fear in? The fear is a fear to disobey. The dread is a dread to dishonor. You, you yearn for God's honor so greatly. And because you know of your weakness, you have a dread that you will dishonor Him. If there is any horror, is it is a horror of displeasing the God whom we desire to please so greatly. That's what the fear of God is. Now, notice how this is 100% antithetical to the world. I, if you look at one, world for, one word for blessing, it is happy. But the first thing he says is, you could say, happy is the one that fears the Lord. And fear has a connotation of dread, of horror. How can that make me happy? That's one reason why many people bypass the church. Or churches that are not showing what this fear really means in its true sense makes a lot of people frustrated and they can leave as well. How can we coincide these two together? This is elsewhere in Scripture. Jesus begins to preach in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5. And he says, blessed, happy, are the poor in spirit, which means you're sad. You're sad that you're poor spiritually. The very next blessing, blessed are those who mourn. And how can you put these two together? See, it's, it's by what the fear of the Lord means. You are displeased. You, you are fearing. You are dreading to displease your Lord. And that's what makes you happy to know that the Lord is pleased. You see the Lord shining his face of favor. And that gives you that joy and that blessing and that contentment. But see, that joy exists because there is that fear. I don't want to displease my father. I want him blessed as well. That's why God's word speaks of the Lord being blessed. It is the Lord with the sense of fulfillment and, and of joy even and of gladness of seeing His child following in His ways. And, and this leads to the second word that our text goes to that, that helps us understand fear even better. Um, so blessed is everyone that feareth the Lord and semicolon and it says that walketh in His ways. Now this is not step two 
to receive that blessing. Step one, fear the Lord. Step two, um, um, walk in his ways. I am not giving steps right here. And I should say that even fear of the Lord is not step one. I'm just saying in the realm of fear of the Lord, and now God's word brought the realm of walking in the ways of the Lord, there will be this blessing. What helps us with this phrase that walketh in his ways, it, it helps us understand what true fear of the Lord is. It is not someone who is there at home just dreading, dreading, dreading. That, that, that's nothing. God does not want that. It is someone who says, Lord, I love you and I want to obey you. Give me the strength. Give me the desire. Give me the teaching. Help me to be productive. I want to walk in thy ways. And see, a, a child of God who is found walking in the ways is a child of God who, who fears the Lord. They go hand in hand. See, it's not step two. It, it is showing what fear of the Lord is. It's, it's what you find often in the Proverbs and Psalms. The second phrase is there to help understand what the first phrase means. And so, a person who fears the Lord will be the person who walks in the ways of the Lord. So that's, that's our second um, phrase, the fear of the Lord, walking in the way of the Lord. People who live in that realm will be blessed. But I commend to you that this is still not the secret. And, and, and let me explain why. Remember when Jesus turned away a multitude of people. They were greatly blessed the day before. Think if you were one of those little children just seeing bread and fish everywhere. And you, and you heard the news that all they had were a few breads and fish. And, and how, how in the world are 5,000 people being fed? You need to be there the next day. And so you join the crowd because you want the blessing. You want the bread. You're hungry again. You didn't have breakfast. Jesus produced dinner last night. Maybe he'll produce breakfast this morning. And Jesus turned them away. And remember the phrase he said, you are seeking the bread that perishes. And this is why I speak in terms of secret. And it's not because God is making it a mystery. He is making you and me dig deep in God's word. Because it's really there, very clear. If what you want is the blessing, you want the fulfillment, you want the joy. You want the peace. There's a logical reality why you would want all that. But if that's all you want, you will never, ever find it. You must want the Lord of the blessing. See, blessed is everyone that feareth the Lord. And see, even though I began with fear and then I went with walking his ways, still if you stop to think, the, the, the crux of the matter here is the Lord whom you are to fear and the Lord whose ways you want to follow. And this is why the, the next word I want to lead you to is from Psalm 125. And look at exactly how that psalm begins. And here you, you see what I mean by God's word being very clear and, and commending us in the way. It, it is not saying, you want blessing, but I will hide how to get it. No, it is our heart that hides it because I say, I want blessing and I want it now. And I want it my way. And God's way says, no, my way is me. If you want blessing, you must want me. Because to have blessing, you must fear me. And you must walk in my ways. And how in the world can a soul do this? Look at verse 1 of Psalm 125. They that trust in the Lord shall be as Mount Zion, which cannot be removed, but abideth forever. See, the very first, psalm, very first verse in Psalm 125 points us to faith. And beloved, I know that in many sermons, in many ways, you've been driven there. How is it that you will be saved? It is not through your work. It is not through your merit, through nothing in you. It is through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And as soon as we say faith, we're saying in that, not of yourselves. It is a gift from God. Faith in Jesus. And see, true faith in Jesus is when you say, I want Jesus. I don't want the bread that Jesus gives. I want him. So that would be you saying, I don't want happiness for the sake of happiness. I want Jesus because he makes me happy. I want Jesus in my family. I want Jesus in my work. 
And, and I want Jesus in, in, in all of my life. I want Jesus in my church. I want Jesus in my country. I want Jesus in this whole entire world. That, that is what is blessing for me. Christ and his name. Now, there's one more place to go to. And this, these psalms help us as well. These psalms, way before Jesus came and died, were already pointing to the people. And I, I do believe for the people there, you feel sorry for those who lived in the Old Testament times because the secrets there were being unfolded and revealed little by little. And they were quite hazy, you could say. But it was still there. But you, By faith, you would get it. Today, it's a lot more clear. Remember what I said about faith, I mean blessing. And, and I'll end with this thought. Blessing means all these words. Fulfillment, joy, happiness, contentment, peace. But the opposite of blessing are not these words. The opposite of blessing is curse. Because curse means the permanence of all these things. Forever. We are born into this world with the curse of Adam. Our sins upon us would make certain not just temporary despair while we live, but eternal despair after we die. Not just some depression while we live, but hell is, is a place of permanent depression. So we want blessing, but we're born into this world with curse. How can we have blessing? Well, the text already pointed us to the Lord. Have faith in Him. But who is Him? The focus here is not the Lord God sitting upon His throne, but the Lord God who came upon this earth and here on earth took the curse. And by taking the curse, your faith in Him makes it whereby the curse is no longer upon you. There will be no more depression forever, no more, no more despair forever, no more frustration forever. And see, beloved, this is where the believer, if he lives in this world and some of that comes, his joy is to know it's only for a while. It's only for a while. And this is where some churches err. There are churches out there who say, you'll become a Christian. Say goodbye to despair. Say goodbye to frustration. Say goodbye to sadness. Your life will be a bed of roses. And see, there are people in those churches who realize the truth. It's not like that. One of my children might suffer. There's somebody who's sick and they realize, wait, Christianity is not for me. And they leave. But see, they're, they're being told a, a falsehood in that church. Now, I'm not here telling you that if you become a Christian, there will never be anything from this middle list of sadness and sorrow. But see, if you are blessed because you believe in the Jesus who was cursed, who took the curse for you, even if some of this comes in your life, you know that it will never stay forever. Often in this world, God delivers, and you know always for certain in the next, I know for sure it will be gone. Now, I, I want to point you, and, and with this I end, Psalm 129, the very next psalm after 128 that we read will bring a little element, and th this will lead us, in a sense, to our sermon in this afternoon. So I won't preach so much on this verse, but I want to show you how even for the Old Testament believers, God was showing that their focus was to be not just in God the Father, but how can I go to God the Father? You will have to go through the one who would suffer. He would be the one who would give you blessing because he would take the curse. Look at Psalm 129. Many a time have they afflicted me from my youth. May Israel now say, Many a time have they afflicted me from my youth, yet they have not prevailed against me. And then verse 3, The plowers plowed upon my back. They may long their furrows. The Lord is righteous. He hath cut asunder the cords of the wicked. Let them be confounded and turn back that hate me, that hate Zion. Verse 3, you, you, you may have heard this psalm as a prophecy of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
when he was being scourged, especially in Pilate's praetorium, that would have been when the plowers would have made long their furrows. Now, anyone here who has a liking of farming or has seen this, or you may have not done it, but you've seen it. Think not, even if you think of the machinery of creating, the, the plowing the ground, of course you want them to be straight. And if you think of those old days where the man would be behind the oxen and you had just one line, you would want that line very straight and very deep. And this is allusion here of the psalmist. The plowers plowed upon my back. They made long their furrows. And this is attributed to, to the Lord Jesus. You notice who's speaking. It is Jesus. And, and he's speaking metaphorically in a sense because there was no plow, but it was very real that they did scourge his back where the furrows were long and they were straight. It was as if Pilate's soldiers were preparing the back of Jesus for sowing their malicious seeds. They wanted him to die. The, the scourging of the man who went to be crucified was meant to make the body shed so much blood so that it could make the death a little shorter. And there was a saying that they dreaded more the scourging even than the cross. And God's word, we, we will see main, mainly tonight, makes much of the scourgings of Christ. Where Jesus has spoken in Isaiah 50, I gave my back to the smiters. And we find in the text where they did scourge Jesus' back, and here we find the plowers plowing upon my back. And, and I just want to leave you with this one thought. Beloved, a person who would be under that scourge to go to the cross was the whole community saying, this is a cursed man. Cursed be he. And may he die lifted off the ground lest he would curse the ground we are upon. That's why cursed was the man who would hang on a tree. So see, Psalm 28 leads us to the suffering and death of Christ, especially with the focus of him taking the curse. Right after the psalm that says, Blessed is everyone that fears the Lord. So the progression is this, beloved. For there to be blessing in your life, you must fear the Lord. For that fear to be true, you must walk in his ways. For that to even begin, you must trust in the Lord. Who is the Lord? He's the one who took your curse forever so that you may be blessed everywhere and forever. Train your little children to believe that, to yearn after that. And all who do will have this blessing that so many Everyone yearn for, but they're confused. They're seeking the blessing itself and not the Lord of the blessing. But when you see what he undertook for you to be so blessed, then you want a Savior. We want a Savior who died for us. May it be your prayer and mine. Let us pray. Our gracious and glorious Father, how we thank Thee, Lord, for this blessing that is offered to everyone that feareth the Lord, that walketh in His ways. So, Lord, we pray, help us to truly fear Thee. Help us to truly walk in Thy ways. And we know we can only do this by faith, so help us, Lord, truly believe. And we do not just believe for the sake of believing. We believe in a Savior whose back was like a plowed field, even in preparation for his dying on the cross. Help us to understand, Lord, that there Jesus was becoming a curse so that we can receive the blessing. So, Lord, may not a single one of us yearn for the blessing itself. It will be empty. It will be simply searching after pleasure for the sake of pleasure or riches for the sake of riches. This world is after all of that, Lord, but they miss the mark. And it is not a secret, truly, in your word. It is so revealed. Jesus paid the debt 
for cursed people. The chastisement of our peace fell upon him. So, Lord, give us peace as we look to him. Help us to know, Lord, that the secret of blessing is Jesus and him crucified for sinners. We pray in his name. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.